there's nothing you can do in this kind of situation. Nobody's prepared for this kind of event. And we were quite numb. And we were just speechless, silent, watching. It, it was horrifying, but my, my immediate thought was this is the, this is the start of a, of a full-scale war. Hello, I'm Hillary Neal, a journalism and digital media major at Ashland University. Welcome to 9-11 Remembered. Our university, like many others across America, was shocked and forever changed by the events of September 11, 2001. For the 10th anniversary, we gathered members of the AU community to reflect on that tragic Tuesday morning. At some point I went walking through the building for something and noticed people kind of gathered around and huddled around the, uh, some of the television screens. It was break time and uh, I was just downstairs going and getting a panini uh, from one of the Italian bakers and he had the television on. He was very upset, and, but my Italian was horrible at the time so I couldn't really quite understand what, and he just pointed to the television and said, look, look. All of a sudden, the phone rang and that was just as I was about to go and check my emails. And I always check the BBC News and get the headlines from home. I was listening to a sports talk show and uh, the talk host broke in with the story that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. Like a lot of people, my tendency was to assume it was an accident. In fact, the way that they were talking about it on the news, it was as if it was a, a Cessna, some, some pilot had flown off course and, and or fallen asleep or something and flown into it. Someone came in and said that a plane had hit one of the buildings in New York and that it was somehow serious and uh, we were almost finished with the class anyway so I just, um, this was about nine o'clock I think, just after nine. And so I, I uh, dismissed class. I, I turned the, the radio on, um, it was in my car as I was headed back to campus when I learned that it was far, far bigger than what I had been led to believe. I went in and turned the TV on and saw the image and realized that it wasn't a small plane, clearly the damage was significant. Um, so I started watching to see what was happening, just like everybody else did. And it was while we were watching it in, in, uh, in Amstutz that the second tower came down. Uh, and, and it was roughly at that time that the university uh, announced that they were canceling classes for the day. We then started to try and call New York to try and get hold of our friend and make sure he was okay. And of course, nothing. No one could get through to anything. You know, we were just sort of perplexed at first and gosh, that's so bad because one plane had hit a building, World Trade Center. But then a few minutes after we got there, I'm, I, I'm not sure how, how long after, two, five minutes, um, the second plane had hit. And then the, the um, atmosphere and the the reactions of those watching television, most of them were students, changed entirely and they started weeping. And we were quite numb. We were just speechless, silent, watching. I also remember weeping, absolutely. And in part, I think the shocking thing was that got me emotionally more than anything else is when there were, this is all before the buildings crashed. Uh, which was entirely another feeling altogether, frankly, um, is, is when, I, when there was some close-ups of the World Trade Center after the planes had crashed and before the, the buildings had collapsed, that you, where you, wherein you notice that specks of dust seemed to be falling from the building and that they turned out to be people jumping, you know, 80 floors high or whatever, because they, 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 that, that's, that was shocking. Reports kept coming about a plane in Pennsylvania, uh, uh, a plane flying into the Pentagon. And at that point, you really wondered, oh my God, how, how, what, what's next? Uh, when is this going to stop? You can't remember what you were supposed to do. Um, and you just think, well, what can I do? I want to do something, I want to be able to help. And there was nothing anybody could do other than Stay home and keep yourself safe and 
be ready if, if somebody told you we need you to do this? So I was uh, shocked because like I said, I had just gotten back from New York uh, that a uh, few days before that. And I had been in the World Trade Center uh, at the top on the previous uh, Sunday. Well, I suppose like everyone was sort of stunned. You know, it's just like, you know, is this really happening? What's really happening? And, and, and nobody understood, of course, how things were going to play out over the rest of that day and the next couple of days. At the time, we, we heard about the towers, but then, um, you know, those, those fell. And in addition to that, we heard about the, the hijacked planes and, and the Pentagon. And it just seemed like the world was falling right then. And so, as you can imagine, I'm sure you remember, everybody was just kind of in a state of shock. The view of, of the, the, the towers crashing, I mean, it was just extraordinary. I mean, it might as well have been a nuclear weapon, as far as I could tell it, psychologically, to me or other people. So anger at that point, boy, whoever did, the, did this um, should pay. I think the personal fear uh, started to take over that because you really didn't know at what point uh, things would end uh, and, and how powerful were they. And you know, could they do this the next day? Uh, could they do it in a week again? It was horrifying, but my, my immediate thought was this is the, this is the start of a, of a full-scale war. I didn't get angry. I was never angry that day. I just felt really sad because I knew this is just the beginning of the violence. This is not going to be the end. Like the professors, students had their own personal reactions to the terrorist attacks of that day. Jess Baker, a media major and student TV news producer, had just recently been living three blocks from the World Trade Center. As the city she loved crumbled, she knew she had to be there. And we watched, um, we watched the towers crash, um, just like in master control. And um, living there just three weeks before this had happened and so close, it was just like, you see those, that part of your life just you can't believe it. And I grabbed my best friend, who was also kind of the number two here, Laura, and I was like, well, maybe we'll go to Pennsylvania, because we had heard that something had crashed. And, and she had a car, I didn't have a car, and we got in her car, and we didn't even have real media passes. We got to Johnstown, and just as we were getting into Johnstown, they said it's Shanksville. They finally said where it was. So we hit there about 5.36, and there were police, but they let us, they let us through with these made up IDs that, I mean, but the guy just waved us through onto this dirt road. And so we were there and Tom Ridge was the governor at the time. And we listened to him speak about, you know, what, what had happened um, there and just about Flight 93. And how they, they, at that time, even thought that the passengers had fought back. And that's how, you know, it didn't turn back and go to the White House and whatnot. And so they had a tour. Um, two tour buses and we went on the second one because we had gotten there late. We didn't even really know we'd get there in time to see anything or even know he was going to be there. But we got on the tour bus and it was weird because we couldn't even, we couldn't even see anything. It was just this line of, line of smoked out trees basically because it was behind the tree line. And the sun had set, but it was just weird being in that field as the sun set in Shanksville on 9-11. Um, on this big tour bus with a couple other media people just looking at this this line of what had happened. We went to maybe an Eaton Park somewhere in Pennsylvania and finally called our parents and told them where we were and both of our parents knew what thoughts we had. We, we didn't really tell them we were going to go to New York um, and I think we were a little scared to go. So we're still sitting in the Eaton Park and you know this is probably you know later probably eight, nine and I was like want to go and so we decided to go. I remember we just drove and drove and it was dark and you're still hearing all the reports and whatnot and um, we drove, we finally finally get there, it was three or four, it was three or four in the morning by the time we, we got into Jersey. Oh the biggest thing I remember is we both just grabbed each other's hand, I mean that was just, I still get chills, I will always get chills from seeing that smoke in the distance and just we we're the only people on the road. We parked and got out of the car and then we watched the sun rise over the smoke on 912 right across from the towers and it's just yeah we just 
being there and seeing that and that I had lived there just so close to it just so soon afterwards. National media was much obviously inside, but we were just these kids, you know, who had to see it for ourselves, but also students and the historic nature of it and having to be where it was and that's where we went. But yeah, definitely that it was just quiet. It was so quiet. I always wanted to do media and I always wanted to do TV and radio and, and I still, I, that's when Lauren and I got there, like days like that. I know is why I do what I do now. We got home, finally got back to Ashland. I remember calling my dad. He's like, I told you not to go, but I'm also really proud of you. So that was kind of neat. I felt like I had to be there, so I went, even though my parents told me not to. I didn't know anyone there, and I'm not from there, but you know, I did live there for a little bit of time, and in a time where I really grew up a lot. And to see a city that I loved and, um, and in a time of my life that I loved being and to have that happen then, I, I, it, I took it personally and I still, on the anniversaries I still do and it's hard, it's hard to explain to people because we're not the story but what we saw and what we felt and how personal it was. We will always have that together and just the two kids from Ashland University just saying we had to go and be there. Just her and me and her little Chrysler. Uh, and seeing the smoke rising was just, I will always remember that. In the weeks following the attacks, the country changed dramatically. Patriotism blossomed, the Patriot Act became law, and the Department of Homeland Security was born. And we launched the War on Terror, which still continues today. You wouldn't have gone to New York at that time for pleasure. There was no pleasure to be had in New York at that time. They were struggling to get things back in order, and to, whether to you know, start Broadway shows again and things like that. So it was a dramatically changed place. The difference was that how, just how much it stopped a huge nation, a huge, powerful nation, and how many flags went up. I don't think I've seen so many American flags in, in front yards and windows and cars. And I, that was phenomenal to see that because you just don't see that in Britain. You don't get like the British flags flying everywhere at all, really. That's what, of course, was growing over those next few days, next week or two, was that, that um, sense of revenge and we're going to go take somebody out, somebody's going to pay. Uh, I think for most people who had, the, who had those feelings, and not everybody did, but for most people who had those feelings, um, I'm not sure there was a, a lot of concern about who, it was just, we're going to go get somebody. You know, Homeland Security was born, that whole department came from 9-11. Patriot Act was passed to allow some um, you know, federal uh, watching of people who are suspiciously acting on the internet or on email or in chat rooms. Um, had a huge effect both in domestic politics, uh, of course, um, uh, and, and internationally. Self-evidently had a huge effect because we immediately, virtually immediately, went to war against people we thought were responsible. That's the kind of imagery that we've been using in our foreign policy so often. You know, we, we you know, we, we get the, we have the right to do what we think we should do. And in some sense, I suppose we do, but uh, it's not a sense that builds a world. I think it's a bad idea to try to bring democracy, you know, with American tanks and aircraft. Um, because if there's one sure way to discredit the idea of, of liberal democracy, it's to make it look like it's being smuggled in through American, that it comes with American imperialism attached. War against terror still continues, and what that means is that there's a, a serious concern, if not fear, that other attacks of this sort um, can happen again, and we're trying to prevent them. The immediate reactions to the attacks left lasting changes on our lives. Cultural tensions increased, security became a top priority, and we realized that America is vulnerable too. 
Americans had to and I think have woken up to the fact that the world is, can be a colossally nasty place. They dislike, vehemently dislike, what we are, that is to say, what we stand for. A certain view of the world, a certain understanding of what a human being is, uh, and what is good for human beings. We call it freedom, roughly said, and a certain kind of government, you know, self-government, constitutionalism, etc. And they oppose all that. To an extent that it's hard, that it's hard for Americans to accept there are people who hate us. And uh, you, know, you could have endless debates on whether it's they hate us because of who we are or they hate us because of our policy. I, the, answer, the answer is yes. The, the greater tension between de democracy and Islam, uh, I think, is, is, uh, is still being debated. Originally, uh, it, was all, it was thought that the Islamization or the radicalization of Muslims was a ph phenomenon that was entirely in occurring within Europe. But recently, I think there, there has been a, a shift in this, that there have been, uh, especially Somalis in, in uh, Columbus and in Minneapolis, who have, uh, where, where, the, where the Somali population has lost uh, some, of their, some of their adolescence, their, their people in their early 20s, who have gone abroad in order to take up jihad. And I think uh, those are worrisome signs that uh, the radicalization can happen in the United States as well. There's a, there's a, 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 a fear that that form of religiosity, uh, if, if not uh, moderated, uh, will continue to have an impact on, on many Muslims in the world, even if it's a small percentage, it's still a lot of folks. Um, and, and, and therefore, the fear continues that they will act upon these sort of barbaric precepts of attacking everything that they disagree with, Western uh, universalism and so forth. One has to be very careful um, with, uh, with Islam and its uh, relationship to democracy. And I and th th there might be more hopeful signs now that uh, the revolutions are occurring in North Africa and the Middle East. And that what, is, what was seen in the previous 10 years as a great challenge to Amer American democracy will fundamentally change if Egypt, if Tunisia, if, uh, if Libya, if maybe Bahrain and Syria are capable of um, making room for civil liberties, for civil free freedom, for the rule of law in their countries um, and uh, will thereby show to those skeptics that, uh, uh, that the United States on that front really doesn't have as much to worry about as some people have, uh, have suggested. 9-11 um, stands out in my mind as a time when a lot of discussions changed for the worse. We started using the phrase 9-11 um, changed everything, which uh, meant we didn't have to deal with anybody, we'd just go out and kick some people. 9-11 changed everything meant I, get, I, I had permission to be a xenophobe, I had permission to be afraid of anything that looked strange to me, and if I was afraid of it, I could attack it. If there's one thing that helps a tyrant to hold on, uh, hold on to power, or helps tyrants generally hold on to power. It's for, uh, it, it's to allow them to associate Western ideas with Western imperialism. We keep wanting these countries to look like our democracy. Our democracy, we think of it as being very old, and it is for democracy, but it is only a couple hundred years old. The idea of democracy is only a few hundred years old in any, in any full sense of that word. So to ask these countries to behave like American de democratic states is, is a, a little silly. The problem I think for everyone, whether, they're, whether they supported these wars or whether they didn't, is that we have broken open a lot of eggs and we haven't figured out how to make that omelet yet. There's always a balancing act going on in the United States. How, how we're going to protect ourselves, 
versus how much intrusion into our private lives are we going to have in order to, to do that. The easiest thing to say is to be prepared, but then, the, you know, <laughs> prepare for what? Because the, the thing about politics that, you know, political wise men over the centuries have taught us is, is that on the one hand you should be prepared to be surprised, and on the other hand you can't be prepared for the surprises that come your way. However you understand that, especially regarding peace and war, that's true. Security is a funny thing. I mean, people want security when something bad happens, but then after a period of time, security becomes awkward and becomes inconvenient and people start to not want it anymore. Did we learn to pat people down, including six-year-olds at airports? I mean, is that the effect of this? That seems kind of silly to me, uh, but arguably that's one of the things we've learned. So life has become less convenient. On the other hand, it's life. On May 1st, 2011, Osama bin Laden was captured and killed by an American military team. This event put the anniversary into a new perspective, posed new questions about our country, our position as a world power, and whether or not justice had been done. When they found Osama bin Laden, that was, I remember digging through my boxes and finding the pictures again, and I posted, I've got this panoramic picture of her just with the smoke and her with, you know, the TV2 camera. And, you know, I posted it and it just, it felt like a personal victory there. So now with the death of Osama bin Laden and, and all of the kind of media coverage and discussions that we're having in our nation right now, uh, it, kind of, it kind of brings us back to where we were uh, 10 years ago. But very quickly I was really uh, uh, disappointed because the president so quickly phrased it in terms of uh, justice uh, justice has been done and we got our man. But the first thing to be said in agreement with the president in this case is is that it was a good thing that bin Laden was killed. It was good that he was killed the way he was killed. There was a kind of personal um, aspect to it uh, that seemed justly retributive justice rather than blowing the place up. You sent in American boys to shoot him. You know, later he said he, w he didn't want to release the photos, for instance, because he said, we don't, you know, we got our touchdown, we don't need to spike the ball in the end zone. And I think there are good reasons not to release the photos because they're an ongoing uh, provocation, would be an ongoing provocation. But essentially, with the, we got our man and, and, um, justice has been done and that language, I mean, we've already done our end zone dance and it would be a matter of kind of recovering from that. We are decried by our enemies as being soft and silly and so forth, uh, which of course has never been true, by the way, interestingly enough, uh, that we can be very dogged and determined and that we are not only have technological savvy, which of course this uh, incursion into Pakistan territory proved, uh, but we also have uh, the ordinary cojones that it takes to uh, to act both in our interest and in, in this case with a sense of justice and that that is I think a very interesting statement to the world and people sitting around their coffee tables and and tea rooms and so forth uh, understand how serious these Americans are. I, mean, I have no doubt that bin Laden was was responsible uh, but also I have no doubt that justice in the sense that we like to use that word in the sense that it means civilized civilized handling of harm uh, and civilized and a process of punishment I have no doubt that that was not done we achieved retribution or revenge justice is about process it's about an orderly sense of law and 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 development there are sort of uh, causes in history and ironies in history and and sometimes justice gets done in history and this is one of those occasions even though it took nine and a half years. And so I think it's a conversation that, that really hasn't ended from the time that, that the um, trade centers were hit and this uh, war on terror that we've had for the last decade. Uh, it's a continued conversation and now it's a continued um, 
example of how we have to handle that and handle that well as a country, not just for political relations, but certainly for how our children understand um, violence and war and, and seeking justice. West Point cadets throwing their caps in the air when they heard that bin Laden was killed. Uh, CNN camera panned to American soldiers in a camp in Afghanistan who were not cheering. I think that was a perfect poetic expression of both the good and the problem that the good is causing. In other words, there'll be more dangerous, more bad guys to fight. Uh, so this is by no means over, but everybody feels better about it because the Aristotelian final cause of this terrorist act in New York is now dead. Elizabethan England, they, they talked about vengeance as a kind of wild justice because it, it uh, creates other responses. And if you look at any feuds and, and the like, I mean, that does. This is not the justice that puts an end to things, not justice that heals. Terrorists want to provoke an overreaction. They want to make their enemies do something that will push moderates to join them and the sort of feeble responses that had been made to previous terrorist attacks were not enough to do that. 9-11 um, did it. Our response to it has been overblown as our response is usually overblown to times when we feel we've been attacked. That's, that's pretty human that we do that. I think we have to figure out how we can make appropriate responses. We can't change our way of being. Uh, we can't change the American soul just because someone doesn't like it and he comes out of his cave and occasionally takes pot shots at us. Uh, and that rightly, and again, maybe if you like, <clears throat> imprudently, uh, but rightly, an American response to that is, you know, the hell with you. We will live as we choose to live. And, you know, you can do what you want, or try to do what you want, and we'll try to prevent that. And you, if you want to live in caves, you go ahead and live in caves. We don't live in caves, we live in the sunlight. And we think human beings uh, are naturally free, and the best way of life has to do with that freedom as we understand it. Not just for Americans. I don't know that we're going to ever really be in a situation in our country from here on out where, where this isn't on our radar that isn't something that's going to affect us, um, the relationships that we have with others, individuals who may not uh, be in agreement with, uh, with our country and, and, and our religions and, and different political values. And so there's, there's, I think, always going to be somebody else that's going to kind of take the place of, of uh, Osama bin Laden, and, and we're never really going to go back to, you know, when we think about when we were growing up and how carefree it seemed to be. It was an interesting experience. I never thought it would be I would be one of the last people ever to go up there. I was taken aback by it. It made it very personal for me because I had been there so recently. You, can't, you still can't believe it happened. Like, I know it's changed everything. It's changed so much about America. Even now, we will always remember 9-11. But seeing that tape again, you just, you still get the chills and you just, it's still hard to believe that someone would attack us and that those towers are just gone and they were there. And they're still gone. It's just, it's still a weird place to be. Everybody will remember where you were on September 11, 2001. It gave me a deeper appreciation of the things for which we stand as a people. That's the short of it, to be honest. I mean, and I'm willing to fight for it if necessary and even die for it if necessary. There's some things worth fighting for. It was real life for us and we're still we're still part of that. That will always be our, you know, our World War II or our Vietnam, just those things you will always remember, our Kennedy. This has been 9-11 Remembered. I'm Hillary Neal. Thank you for watching. Good night.